Good to go. Richard Reeves. Thank you so much for joining me. I oh, really appreciate it. This is Richard V. Reeves. Well, you've got to add the V because yeah. there is another Richard Reeves. Who oh, that's is right. A famous historian. And I'll be honest with you. Fortunately, just died. That's who I thought I was talking to today. Yeah. So I'm a little want, disappointed. Do you want me to go? <laughs> no, no, you can say I mean, if no, you no, want you're... to hear about Nixon or Kennedy, <laughs> then he's the guy. We, we occasionally get, got confused with each other. Really? Yeah, I got asked to go on the BBC to talk about Nixon once. Yeah. Uh, and I and let <laughs> them get all the way to I didn't actually go on. Oh, my God. But it's great. You should have done it, honestly. I would have liked that. About it. Yeah, yeah. I thought about it. I mean, this is awesome. I'm so excited to talk to you. Okay, yeah. author of Of Boys to Men, um, no, Of Boys and and Men. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of the R&B group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had people suggest that it would have done better if I'd called it that. But then my experience is that people will buy it thinking it's about the group. And yeah, yeah, send yeah. it back. So That's you fair. Get, you can get like negative sales on Amazon. It's oh, like, really? Yeah, yeah. Where people think I'm doing really well, and then they all come back because and they're like, yeah. This is not about R and B. Yeah, it's by some Brookings scholar. It's yeah, got yeah, shots yeah. in it. But handsome guy though. Look shots. at you. I mean, you're tall. You got nice hair. Thank you. But nice. Thank you. Um, you do an Americano. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Why do you go Americano? Uh, I just like it straight. It's like no messing around. Yeah. Right. This there's this tendency to have like a frappuccino, no fat, soy, <laughs> whatever the hell. There's this actually there's a cafe in Australia that, that there's this coffee where. You can have a decaf, non-fat latte, and they call it the why bother. That's funny. Like, why bother? <laughs> so it was like, can you have a why bother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's actually really funny. I'm like, if you're going to have coffee, yeah, yeah, yeah. have coffee. Yeah, make it hit. Well, just, yeah, like make it what it is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's I like, like that. I just think, I'm the same with, like, you know, when I drink, it would be the same sort of thing. Just do what you're doing. Life Don't do O'Doul's. Don't no. do, like, the, the no alcohol so beer. If you're going to do it do it <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair well thank you so much for joining me this is really really cool i've uh i've read a lot of your book not the whole thing it's very long a lot of pages <laughs> it's not very long. it's it's kind of long for me it's a little long okay it's not a yeah. tweet yeah. but uh okay. well you're a boy the, I mean, you're a man exactly exactly can't, you can't sustain the attention long enough that's, that's exactly right straight into the substance here yeah, yeah yeah so i was reading it and i thought it was very very interesting and it's a problem that i didn't really know about mm -hmm. so you kind of outlined in the book that there are three places in society that men are failing or falling behind. Mm -hmm. um, would you just mind explaining like what those three are and then we can jump into one of them? Sure, I mean, they're, they're a big three because they're education, work and family. Yeah. And so in terms of like the structure of your life and how you're doing in life, I'd count those as, as pretty big ones. Mm -hmm. And so in education, we now see that there's a, a much bigger gender gap in education today than there was 50 years ago but it's flipped it's right. the other way around. Mm -hmm. So just get one data point on this is that in the US now, women are 15 percentage points more likely to get a college degree. Mm -hmm. Back in 1972, it was 13 percentage points the other way. Right. Men were more likely to get it. And in every subject, pretty much everywhere, and in most advanced economies, there's now this big gender gap in education. In employment, what we've seen is particularly for less skilled men, men who maybe high school education, and not much more, a really big drop in labor force participation. So there's like 10 million men in that group who are out of the labor force. And a lot of them are not unemployed, so they don't show in the unemployment statistics. Mm -hmm. They're just out of the labor force. And I think partly as a consequence of those two changes, but also because of the dramatic changes in family life and the astonishing and, and welcome rise of women's economic power right. has been to leave a lot of fathers on the bench. Right. And so with the hollowing out of traditional marriage for lots of great reasons that has asked put a new question mark around the role of fathers and so there are a lot of fathers now who are not in touch with their kids not living with their kids but more importantly not in a relationship with their kids and so I, I there's a fatherlessness problem as well and i think all of those problems obviously then reinforce each other yeah yeah absolutely and now as far as education goes i know that you mentioned in the book like you have all these statistics about how men are falling behind relative to women yeah why does it matter that it's relative to women? And is it objectively, are they objectively falling compared to men 50 years ago? So it's, there's a difference, as you point out, between like a relative measure and an absolute measure. Right. So if, you, if you've got one group doing better than another, then does it matter if everyone's doing okay? That's my question. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a, that's a really important question because some in some of these areas, so in it, you just see boys are doing better than they were but girls are just doing even better than they were they're, 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 which that seems fine so what that seems fine so the question is on its face does that matter and you could say the same about the gender pay gap 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so men earn more than women, but women earn a lot more than they used to. So does it matter that there's a gender pay gap? Mm. Right. If women are earning a lot more than they did, does it matter if they're earning less than men? Right. Well, yes, because that's about economic power. It's about resources, about what you can buy. Right. Mm -hmm. you can go and do that. So does it matter? Does this thing matter? Does education matter? Well, if education matters for the chances to have a good flourishing life, if it's a way to get into the labor market and succeed, then you should at least be attentive to gaps by gender, by race, by class, by geography. If you say, well, why is one group doing so much worse than another group? I think at the very least, you should see that as a data point to go investigate mm -hmm. and see if there's anything structural happening there and see whether or not it matters. So if education doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if boys aren't doing as well as, as right. girls. Yeah, yeah. If earnings don't matter, like imagine a world where everyone has a universal basic income anyway. Sure. You don't need earnings. Would the earnings gap matter? No. Right. And so you're asking a sharp question, which is to what extent does it matter? The reason I worry about what's happening to boys and men is that in some cases you just see almost no absolute improvement mm -hmm. in, in their overall education, but also just because in the current labor market, education does matter. Right. And so on its face we used to worry about gender inequality in education the other way around right and we were right to worry about that because of what it meant about the labor market and i think we should worry about it for boys and men for the same reasons that makes sense and now i'm sometimes leery of like statistical abnormalities right like that's like a mark twain quote right like mm. lies damn lies statistics mm. so like when you get all these statistics i sometimes look at them like well is this telling the whole story how can I trust these statistics are not accounting for, are these are just, you know, not corollary and they're actually causal or vice versa. Yeah. So is there possible that boys are going to college at lesser rates because they're pursuing entrepreneurship at higher rates or because they're doing other things outside of college that then would sort of indicate that yeah. statistical anomaly? Well, I think the first thing is the, the basic point you've made is an important one to just pause on anyway, which is essentially in the current environment, you can decide what you believe and then go find some statistics that support you. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely, especially the internet and so on too. Now, so the problem with that is how good are those statistics? Mm -hmm. uh, you can almost choose your statistics. You can choose which year, how you adjust it for inflation, who you include. There's a whole bunch of boring stuff you can do exactly. to get you the result you want. Yeah. And so I, I, I actually think, given that I'm a Brookings scholar, I'm a, I am duty bound to mm -hmm. try and call it as I see it and produce the best statistics I possibly can. Could you can. explain what that is to me, by the way? I don't really, I'm not an academic. I don't know if you can tell, okay? I have long hair. Well, but there's <laughs> a lot of academics with long hair. I assume you could be a sociology professor. You think so? Definitely. That is an insult, okay? Definitely. I'm, I, I feel it as an insult. <laughs> I, I apologize. Maybe I should be apologizing to sociology. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on sociology. I don't know who I'm offending here, but anyway, everybody as usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does it mean to be a Brookings scholar? Like, what is that? So Brookings entail? is a, it's a think tank. It's a mm -hmm. policy think tank. We do we do research that's intended to make public policy better, mm -hmm. but not partisan. So like I'm not looking over my shoulder, caring whether the Republicans are going to hate this, the Democrats are going to hate that. It's just like this is what I think. This uh. is this is this is how we think you should proceed. And it could be on income inequality, it could be on college debt cancellation, it could be foreign policy. And so we try and be expert, but not partisan. Right. And so I do think that's that's genuinely something I take very seriously, which mm -hmm. is that if I say something. A, if I get it wrong, I'll correct myself. But B, I don't want people to think that I'm just selecting the facts that suit my argument. Right. right? It, what we, have, we have too much of that. We have too, too much like opinion-based fact selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're right to say, okay, let's say you guys aren't going to college as much. Is that a problem? It's a question, not an answer. Right. Let's go up. Let's go find out. And it is a problem because the guys who aren't going to college, who are struggling to get into the labor market, if they were looking after their kids, say, Right, while their partners or wives are working, okay. Right. So actually, in many ways, you see that's a hugely positive change. If they were starting up successful new businesses, you'd be like, okay, no problem. Right. But they're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By and large, it's just detached from the labor market. And so they're, they're much more likely to be drifting or not quite sure what they're doing, figuring it out. And not necessarily, that's not necessarily a bad thing either, but it's not as if we know what they are doing mm -hmm. instead of education or employment and those things are good right it's that we don't really know what they're doing that makes sense and i know that you know we talked about this briefly before but this is a tenuous subject right to be talking about like hey actually boys are falling behind in school and boys are falling behind in the labor market like that is something that is kind of 
controversial to say now, you know, in our current political climate. So most of your work before this has been about, you know, class inequality, mm -hmm. racial inequality. Mm -hmm. How did this get on your radar and why is this something that you're so passionate about that you would potentially, you know, like risk public judgment to, to go into this field? Well, the first point you make is absolutely true, of course, because these issues are so fraught they're so politicized they, they they're, they're very personal to people and and i want to be clear that i totally understand that i totally understand how even talking about this can create a sort of visceral reaction mm -hmm. especially in women mm -hmm. i mean like i i have a, a wife who's trying to raise money right now uh for for a startup business and so i know that only two percent of venture capital money goes to female founders oh, really? i'm reminded of this on a least a daily basis <laughs> and she is someone who compared to her mum and so on has really benefited from the changes of the last few decades right the transformation it's such a recent change that to suddenly start saying oh wait, wait let's do we need to worry about the boys and the men now mm -hmm. like it was it, it was literally yesterday that right. women were having to fight to get into these institutions and by the way there's still a huge amount more to do especially at the top of society right in terms of politics and corporate leadership and so on too so i totally get that this is this is difficult mm -hmm. so then why why enter into it well i've raised three boys mm -hmm. for one thing and so i think i should say that because it's crazy to pretend that doesn't affect your scholarship sure right we just talked about being objective and non-partisan but that's not the same thing as not being human. Yeah, exactly. And clearly the book is influenced. I talk about my sons in the book. The book is dedicated to my three boys all mm -hmm. now, all now in their 20s. Right. My oldest son is the same age as you. Oh, really? Which is terrifying <laughs> <laughs> for both of us. Yeah, probably. exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I, you know, I've raised them in the UK and the US and seen a little bit what it, what it was like for them to grow up in this world. Oh, wow. But, the, but then in, in my day job, like I'm looking at trends, I'm looking at policy, I'm looking at statistics, and I kept tripping across some pretty big issues around gender and not in the traditional way you'd think about it. You traditionally would think, oh, gender inequality, worry about women and girls. Of course. But especially for black boys and men, mm -hmm. and especially for working class boys and men, there's a lot to worry about. You know, mm -hmm. Threefold higher rate of suicide or death of despair. We've already talked about education, detachment from the labor market. There's a bunch of stuff happening with boys and men now that cut across some of our other concerns around economic inequality and just basically human flourishing. Like if, if your goal is to promote human flourishing for as many people as possible, regardless of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, where they grew up, etc., then you see a group who are struggling then you draw attention to that group and try to come up with some solutions. That so makes I, sense. I, in a sense, it's you know the risk of sounding really pompous about this. Mm -hmm. Sort of like if a Brookings scholar working on issues of inequality can't take the risk of right. talking who, about this issue. Who, who can? can? Yeah. And also it becomes a vicious circle if you don't talk about this stuff because you're afraid that people go, oh, yeah, alt-right, men's right, lunatic, etc. Mm -hmm. Then it means the only people who are willing to talk about this stuff are alt-right, men's rights, lunatics. Uh, so the cycle turns. It might be the least qualified people that are talking about yes. important issues that then alienate people even further. Right. So if, if, if people of goodwill don't engage with the issue, then we shouldn't be surprised if people of less goodwill, let's put it that way, mm. are the ones talking about it. Yeah. And, and so my work in this space, I'll be completely candid about the strategy for the book here with you is yes it's about content it's got charts and policies and you know and and so on but it's also about creating space mm -hmm. it's about creating space for this kind of conversation mm -hmm. it's about creating the opportunity for you and i to talk about this in a way that is hopefully respectful of all sides understands the nuances and complexity of it but still has the conversation that you are frankly willing to have this conversation right right and i'm sure you're going to get hit a little bit <laughs> but by and large i've been pleasantly surprised people people are much better at having two thoughts in their head at once yeah than most people think they are yeah you yeah, know yeah. so that, that's why i ended up writing it that makes sense and then labor market mm. so i'm really curious like if i'm assuming like okay we're accepting that this problem is real based off the statistics Men are falling behind in comparison to women, and then also objectively, they might be falling in behind. In some cases, yeah. In some cases, if men created these systems, yeah, why are they failing within the systems mm. they created? Yeah. So the labor market is a great example of an area where it's not just a relative shift; it's an absolute shift. So most American men today earn less than most American men did in 1979. Is the same true for women? Absolutely not. Women today earn more than women did in 1979. Mm. So it's not a class issue. This is a gender. But now, 
except I said most American men. Right? Mm. So you're, you're, you're exactly right to go to class because what that means is the median American men and actually about 60% of American men today are, are worse off adjusting for inflation than 60% of American men were back in 1979. Mm. Men at the top have seen pay increases. I'm sure. So men at the top are better off than men at the top were back in 79. Women have seen increases across the board, but especially at the top. So what we've seen is this growth in economic inequality with both men and women at the top seeing big increases in their earnings, women lower down seeing increases in their earnings, and men lower down seeing falling earnings. Hmm. So you know, if American men were a country, that country would be a little bit poorer today than it was almost 50 years ago. Wild. That's an important fact. And so, because it's not just relative, right? Look, any any increase by a previously disadvantaged group is going to mean that the previously advantaged group are relatively losing ground. Right. That's called progress. Right. That's called equality. Right. And so it doesn't trouble me at all that we're seeing the relative posi economic position of men and women uh, becoming more equal. Like 40% of women now earn more than the typical man. Right. Interesting. Think about the distributions overlapping there. Right. It used to be 13%. Right. So previously, if I wanted to know how much you earned, knowing whether you're a man or a woman was a really good first question to ask. That mm -hmm. would tell me a lot about how much you were earning. Now it's not a very good question. Mm -hmm. I need to know your education, your class, your geography, and so on too. Okay. So you've got what you've got is these different inequalities pulling in different directions. You've got economic inequality growing, class inequality growing. That was what I wrote about before. You've got racial inequality either growing or pretty stuck. Right. And then you've got gender equality getting much better. So mm. to put a fine point on it, uh, white women now earn much more than black men. Hmm. They didn't in 79. Sure. So white women have overtaken black men in terms of earnings and blown right past them and are now earning a lot more. So what that means is you have to think there's this phrase uh, now called intersectionality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so Kimberly Crenshaw actually was invented the phrase. And what it means is just you have to look at different dimensions at the same time. Mm hmm. Uh, and I think especially with gender now, you have to look at gender and race and class. It's much harder now to just say women are worse off. Got because it. Because for a lot of women, that's not true. It is still true for some women, but there are now also quite a lot of men who are in trouble too. Got it. Okay. So now we see education, labor force, men are falling behind. Can you really pinpoint the why? Like I'm a kid in school. I'm in middle school. I'm however old I am when I'm in sixth grade. What is happening to me that is making me feel so disenfranchised with this academic process? Yeah, so I think that the answers are going to be different for education and work, but of course they're also going to be related. Right. If you come out of the education system having not done very well, you're going to struggle in the labor market. Exactly. And that's much more true today than it was before. So let's do employment first, which okay. is the sorts of jobs that, let's say, you know, your dad could do, having graduated from high school, could you go and get a pretty good factory job and earn a decent living. Mm -hmm. That's not true anymore. The kinds of jobs that men used to be able to do and succeed really just because they were men. Okay. <laughs> they've gone. They've gone because of trade, free trade. They've gone because of automation. Mm. Those physical jobs have just massively declined. And I so see. what that means is that for men as, as well as for women, getting more educated is increasingly important to having good employment. Right. So that relationship between education and employment is getting stronger. So then to come back, well, why aren't boys and men doing as well in education? Certainly nothing like as well as, as women are, girls and women are, but in some cases, not just, just not doing very well, just period. Um, I think the reason for that is because the education system is not very male friendly. Okay. It's actually more female friendly. Okay. Uh, and that's a weird thing to say because the education system was invented by men. So the point you made earlier, Men created these systems. Exactly. It's like the Prussian schooling model or whatever, that's right? Like that's what it's all based off of. Yeah. So so men invented the education system, put in place the education system. So how can it possibly not be male friendly? And the answer is accidentally. Okay. You know, it, it wasn't deliberate. But the the way education is structured is that it rewards certain kinds of skills. The ability to pay attention, the ability to the ability to stay on task, the ability if I may risk saying this, to finish a 200-page book. It's so even many pages. A, like, is there no cliff notes or something? <laughs> there is, actually. There's a yacht. Okay, yacht excellent. Yacht. Do you have apparently, an audio book? Apparently, yeah. Hmm? You need an audio book, too. I've done it. Did you read it? I did. And okay, good. slight digression is that I had to audition uh, <laughs> to, to do it. And, and I, I said, but, but, but I talk about myself and being British. 
So if I don't get the part <laughs> of playing myself, yeah, yeah, yeah. first of all, that's going to create all kinds of existential angst for me, which is like I auditioned <laughs> for the part of me nope. and failed. Orlando Bloom got thought, it. Who will, you get, <laughs> who, who will you get to read it if I don't read it? And they yeah. said, we'll just find some unemployed British actor. That's so funny. The best actors, though, be honest, right? <laughs> what the unemployed British one. <laughs> yeah. so, any anyway, British actor I trust. So I, I'm delighted to announce yeah. that the audition went well. Okay. Uh, I got the part of me. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. That's, that's uh, a tough job. And I read my own book. So it is out, <laughs> it is out on audio. So yes, yeah, so if you can't bear the pages, then... Okay. And we, we were talking earlier about the fact that podcasts, audio books are in some ways a return to an older way of... That's what I see. Talking. And actually, my, I, I, look, I will say that I will see in my own... More, more, some of my sons more than others, actually, that the old style of learning just seems redundant to them. I mean, one of my kids would say to me, why would you read a book when you can listen to a podcast or watch something on YouTube? Like yep. literally, what is the point? If you can get most of the information, say even maybe from this conversation, it's yeah. in the book, why would you go and buy the book? By the way, go and buy the book. Or, or just listen to this. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, <laughs> Screw the book. Or buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> buy the book. I have two kids in college. Please buy the book. Okay, okay yeah, buy the buy book. book. Buy the book. <laughs> um, so anyway, I've completely forgotten. What were we talking about? Uh, in terms of boys being in school and being able yeah. to finish okay. books and Great. finish thoughts. Thank you. Uh, good, good job. Thank you. See, I, and now, now you've proved me wrong, of course. Because there we go. There we I forgot. <laughs> I'm a sociologist, okay? Oh, Don't right. forget that. Yeah, PhD in sociology. Right? <laughs> so um, if there's certain things that the education system rewards, like, as I say, stay on task, even if it's intrinsically a bit dull, mm -hmm. worry about your future, think about your GPA, etc. So, you know, preparedness skills. Those, all those skills develop earlier in girls than in boys. Right. right. It's just a fact. So for all the debates about brain science and female and male brains and all that stuff, what there's no question about is that girls develop a bit earlier than boys on average. Mm -hmm. So a 16-year-old girl, her brain has developed more than a 16-year-old boy on average. Right. And specifically in this area of the brain, which is about the bit that allows you to sit through an incredibly boring chemistry class hmm. and still pay attention and then go home and do your incredibly boring chemistry homework sure. and turn it in, you know, all the things that like just are hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They turn out to be harder for boys. When does that level out roughly? What age? Uh, about 25, 26. Oh gosh. Okay. You made it. Take that ladies. I'm catching up. All right. <laughs> I'm gaining on you. <laughs> well, uh, or this is as good as it's going to get. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. Downhill from here. It's about mid twenties. Uh, <laughs> and so look, so one question people would then ask, okay, if the education system was always structured to favor girls a bit more than boys, because they develop these skills earlier. And at this crucial point, like 16 is a really important age mm -hmm. in the education system. Then why didn't we see it before? Yeah, this like, seems so dumb. Why Why are we only seeing this now? And the answer is because of sexism. Girls weren't encouraged to go to college. Girls right. weren't encouraged to pursue an academic career. And so actually, if you even back in the 60s, girls were doing slightly better in high school than boys. Hmm. Slightly. In the 60s. So just off rip. You put girls in school, they're just beating boys. Just on Correct. We just took the brakes off. Or yeah. another way to put it is, we've essentially, by leveling the playing field in education, by creating opportunities and aspirations for girls and women mm -hmm. uh what we've done is we've exposed the fact that they're better they're better players they're just naturally better players mm -hmm. and so on a level playing field they're going to kick our asses and that's basically what's happening um, is that the natural advantages of girls and women in the current education system have only become visible once we took the brakes off mm -hmm. and allowed their aspirations and opportunities to flourish and so essentially what was happening was sexism was keeping a lid on, on women's educational performance. And on this problem in general. Actually. Yeah, and then suddenly, boom, we took the lid off. And nobody predicted, by the way, that when we were fighting for gender equality back in the 70s to get more women into education, more women into college, nobody predicted that they would just keep going. No one predicted the overtaking. Everyone was focused on, we need to catch up, we need women and girls to do as well as men. Which was right? the right attitude at the time. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I completely support it. But what no one expected was that the line would just keep going. Right. And that it wasn't that girls and women would catch up with boys and men, but they would blow right past them and keep going. And so now in this new world, which is like, huh, okay, what's going on here? And one thing that's going on is we've just lit a fire mm. for women and girls, which is amazing. I think that's an interesting amazing. point. I think it's important, too, to say, like, hey, this is not, equality is not a zero-sum game. Correct. And that 
women have all of a sudden been put into this academic system and they've excelled. Yes. Which is excellent, which is great. Don't even change that at all. Women Not are at all. so great. Not at all. We just need to make some adjustments to the way that boys are being taught. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, I know you have interesting solutions to this, hmm. but if you first could just explain what do you think is the ideal male learning environment? If I just gave you $10 mm -hmm. million, dollars, said, hey, go make a school for boys, mm -hmm. what would that look like? Oh. Well, the first thing we would do is start them in school a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So uh, I Maybe think we... 18, 19. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <something> like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go play rugby. Go let, have fun. Let the, let do them, fireworks. You could do first five years would be video gaming only. Thank This uh, is great. I'm uh, a fan right. of this. I think this <laughs> right. will work. And then once you've, once you've you know, mastered all the main video games, so I think we'd start a little bit later for sure because boys do mature later. So I think that it would be better if they started at like five or six rather okay. than four or five. I think that's one thing. Second thing is you definitely start school later in the day. That's oh, good really? for girls too, by the way. But yeah, it's crazy. US high schools, they just start so early Dude, in the morning. I used to wake up at like 6.30. And I look back on it and I'm like, how did I do that it's, for years? It's a huge problem. Six in the morning, I'm waking up it's and I insane. went to bed at like 12. It's insane. And it turns out that it's bad for everybody. But if you don't, if, if it's difficult for you to discipline yourself to go to bed earlier yeah. than your brain is telling you to, this is just like teenage brains are wired this way, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you're exhausted the next morning. And so there's all these studies showing how just if you did your math class later in the day, as opposed to early in the day, the kids did better in math if they were doing math later. Are there any countries that start later? Are yeah, almost every, every, almost every country. Really? Yeah, the U.S. is very, it's because of, it's because of agriculture. It's so that the kids could leave school early enough to go and help in the fields. This is the Prussian schooling thing where it's like, oh, the summers are so, off. Well, the summers are so long. Yeah, so the U.S. the U.S. education system, both in terms of the time of day that you go to school and the length of the summers is based around the agricultural cycle. And so kids had to go to work first thing in the morning so they could come and help in the fields and they had to be off for long periods in the summer to do the harvest. I didn't hear about this. I didn't do any field work. And I was never harvesting anything. It turns out that not many kids <laughs> are helping with the harvest. I never anymore. even saw a hay bale until I was like 16. <laughs> right. It just never happened. Okay. It turns out that it's it's really not the best way to structure an education system. It's wild. But it does it does clearly hurt boys to get I mean, my own kids, we actually ended up getting involved in a campaign around this to start school later where we were. And and there was one point he had to get the bus from, from where we lived at the time. And for large parts of the year, he was getting up in the dark yeah, yeah. and walking to the bus in the dark. It's cold. At whatever it was, 6.30, yeah. so, to go to school. And he's like, no wonder he's not doing very well in school. So yeah. I, do, well, I did the same thing. I would go to school early, come home at like 3. I had soccer practice most of the days. Yeah. But if I didn't have soccer, I was going to sleep. Yeah, I would just that's fall asleep immediately after asleep. school. They would come home full asleep. I was just always tired. Yeah. And then I went to college and I was like, this is easy. Yeah. But the, academ the academia was harder, but it just turns out my quality of life yeah. was so much better that well, everything also, got it. I mean, the other easier. two things are things like more phys ed, and yeah. that does turn out to be more important for boys on average than girls. Can we just say everything's on average so I don't <laughs> say every time? I thought you meant all <laughs> women always. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. All men are like this. <laughs> all women are like this. Yeah, of course. Distributions never overlap. Yeah, yeah. Right? All generalities yeah, are right. Exactly. Okay. We can, we can gener everything's binary, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but phys ed does, you know, physical movement is more important for boys than girls. And so to the extent we've seen less of that in school mm -hmm. and less extracurricular, uh, that really uh, doesn't help either. So definitely do that. Uh, and more male teachers. So the mm. teaching profession is becoming steadily more female over time. Yeah. Now, 24% of K-12 teachers are women. It was 33% in the, in the, which, hang on, did I say women or men? You said women. Right, so it's the wrong way around. 24% of K-12 teachers are men. Mm. It was 33% and it's dropping. Interesting. I mean, there, that, like, I, that's true one in me. 10 elementary school teachers now are male. Yeah. Almost no early year. I mean, there's there are so few men in early education. It's astonishing. It's about 3%. It's almost creepy. Uh, there's a social stigma around it, I feel like. Yeah, all one of my kids works. One of my, my middle son works in early years education. Right. So he's experiencing this all the time. And of course, if you have such a small number of people doing anything, mm -hmm. then it makes them seem weird. Yeah. And it was the same with women engineers not that long ago. Mm. Like, Women engineers? What's yeah. wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so if you go against gender identity too strongly, then you're obviously going to get that that effect. It's so crazy to me that as a share of the professions, there are twice as many women flying U.S. military planes as there are men teaching kindergarten. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, interesting. About 7% now of, fighter, of uh, U.S. military pilots are women, about 13% of navigators. Uh, but that's twice that as is? many. Why are women flying fighter jets, or why are men not teaching kindergarten? <laughs> like, why that, that disparity seems interesting. Like, why well, we've is there worked, such we've, a push? We've worked really hard 
to open up military positions to women. Right. And so the U.S. Uh, Air Force is redesigning all the cockpits of the planes oh, really? to facilitate, because they have these height requirements. Mm. And so, of course, that excludes shorter men as well, but it disproportionately excludes women, right? If you have a minimum height uh, to be able to sit in the cockpit right. and shoot down... The average height of women is X. Yeah, yeah, then obviously you're excluding a much higher proportion of them. Interesting. Uh, so we've done that. But also just culturally, there's been a real push, I think, to say we do need more women in combat roles. Roles. Mm. I think three. If you go back three generals ago, the general in charge of North American homeland defense was a woman, mm -hmm. and no one blinked. No right. one cared. Right. Right. Well, but they probably shouldn't care. No. You know exactly. I mean? Yeah. What a sign of success it is. Right. When you don't care, but I don't. There have been almost no similar efforts to get men into teaching or caring roles, etc. There's. Uh, yeah. There's just no. There's no, there are no campaigns, there's no money, there's no even a sense that it's a problem that there are fewer and fewer men in our classrooms. Do you think there's a financial incentive there where like, I think men maybe disproportionately are trying to find jobs that yeah. are, you know, Better high pay. paying yeah. to make them more attractive to women, to be breadwinners yep. in their family, et cetera. And if a kindergarten teacher isn't paying six figures, I think most men will be like, why would I pursue that? Yeah, I think there that is true. And it's worth saying that K-12 teachers haven't seen a pay rise for 20 years. Exactly. That seems like so, part of the issue if you like, want more men in there. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's that in and of itself can create a little bit of a pushback because it's like, oh, so what you're saying is that for teachers to get paid more, there has to be men doing it. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Well, you can say that. Um, and it, but it, but it's also true. It's right. true that men are a little bit more motivated by salary uh, than women on average. And that mm -hmm. one of the reasons people opt into those professions is because it's easier to combine it with family. Right. That's so right. it comes back to these gender roles. But let's be realistic about this. Like a lot of the jobs that men used to be able to do and earn decent money, they're not there anymore. And so if they're holding out for a, a manufacturing job that's going to pay as well as a K-12 teacher, well, you might be waiting quite a long time hmm. or a coal miner or whatever the equivalent is. And so there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a lack of you know, a re the reality check here is, look, guys, actually teachers maybe they don't earn as much as other people, but they earn pretty well. Mm -hmm. And it's very secure. Um, there's lots of benefits. You know, there are lots of good things about those professions that shouldn't put men off. And by the way, we used to have a lot more men doing them than we do now right so why the trend away partly is that pay? is that partially the gender roles thing like if women are just working at a lower rate in general in the labor force like of course men are going to be occupying every occupation at a higher percentage correct so just as more women have, have gone into the labor market you've seen have seen a big shift right. for sure but it doesn't there's nothing that there's nothing that should necessarily suggest that teaching by the way i mean psychology is even more true which is crazy maybe we can talk about that why teaching should become a female profession there's nothing, there's nothing written in stone about that. It didn't used to be like that. And, mm -hmm. and you take professions like social work, used to be quite close to gender parity, massively falling away now. Hmm. Psychology is the one that really interested me. And I've, I've learned a bit more even since I wrote the book. In the last 10 years alone, the percentage of psychologists who are male has dropped from 39% to 29%. Really? Among psychologists under the age of 30, only 5% are male. Hmm. And when I first wrote about this, I was thinking the reason that matters is because there are jobs there. there are, these are growing professions. And so if men want jobs, maybe they want to go where the jobs are, mm -hmm. right? And rather than sort of hoping that the coal mine's going to reopen, you should get a job as a teacher or a psychologist or something. Yeah, um, it's, but It's a tough ask though, right? Like, it is tough because it goes against the identity. But, but the tougher the ask, the harder we should be working. I guess precisely because it's hard is why we should be doing it. I'm growing up in like a bad neighborhood somewhere in the U.S. Like my parents aren't around. I don't have any economic mobility. And it feels like you're asking me to be like, hey, don't be an Uber driver. Go be a psychologist. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? I should just go get a Ph.D. Like it feels harder to me if I'm in that situation to just yeah. like like I don't know if you remember the rhetoric around like uh, people like telling truckers to learn how to code. Do mm. you remember this? I do remember. Like, that. truckers were like, hey, our jobs are getting phased out due to automation. Yeah. People were like, learn to code, grow up. Yes. And it's like, it feels like an oversimplification and kind of like an antagonistic barb to put at people that are kind of struggling in the States, frankly. Yeah, I think I, I agree that you have to get the tone of this really right. And the truckers coding thing is a great example of how even for good intentions, people can just like say really stupid stuff mm -hmm. that just misses where people are coming from and where they want to go. And also, of course, we have no idea necessarily how many coders we're going to need, especially <laughs> now that the AI 
has learned to code. Exactly. Right? So yeah, going to destroy You've it got GPT-3. Well, <laughs> when, surely we're not the only one worrying about this, right? It's like a certain, my son said to me, God, GPT-3 is writing code now. I said, wait, the computers are writing computer code? Yeah. It's like no one's watched any sci-fi. <laughs> like, what, yeah. like, like, what's wrong with these people? Yeah, it's terrifying. But code, like, uh, we're not going to need as many coders as perhaps everybody thought. Right. Um, but there, there are jobs like... Meanwhile, we have massive shortages of teachers, nurses, mm -hmm. uh, social care workers for kind of nursing homes and mm -hmm. stuff. So those are real jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're defined in the right way, I do not see why they should be so unappealing to men. They didn't used to be unappealing to men. Mm. And so if we let them, but if we let them become too gender skewed, right, if they become seen as, quotes female professions, then it is hard to get the guy who's in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. to think. He'll laugh He'll laugh at you if you say to him, have you thought about being a nurse? Yeah, which he'll I think laugh it, at you. it probably is in that place now, socially. Like, for me personally, I view nursing as a female profession. Yeah. I view being a K through sixth grade teacher as a female profession. Right, and you're right. Statistically, of course, you're right. right. And through my own personal experience, like going yeah. to, you know, granted, I was homeschooled to like fourth grade. So right. definitely a female. Um, yeah, <laughs> but all my kids' elementary school teachers were female. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, but then... You, Okay, so we then have to decide: Does that matter? Because if it doesn't matter, okay, fine. Let's just let's just let the trend continue, and pretty and, and eventually we'll just have an all female teaching profession. Right. And b every boy in the classroom is only going to see female teachers. But what happens then, I think, is the whole idea of education and of educational success and of loving learning for its own sake and so on starts to be seen as a feminine attribute. Because mm -hmm. if the boys see, a the girls are already beating, doing much better than in class. If all the teachers are then female, and most of the people at college, college is now 60% female on college mm -hmm. campuses. Yeah, that was true for me also. Right? And so uh, there's, a there's a danger you hit a tipping point where actually just persuading a boy that, that education is for him, that it's a, quote, masculine thing, hmm. is going to be a problem. So then you hit a tipping point from which it's very hard to come back. And so as I see the proportion of teachers heading towards 80% being female, I worry what that means for the message we're sending to boys hmm. about education, educational success and risking anecdote rather than data. I know that in my secondary school, the fact that I had a male English teacher is one of the reasons I'm sitting here because it taught me to love writing and poetry and ideas and so on. That's why you talk like that with the accent. <laughs> yeah, that's from him. He's yes. a British guy. Hey, hey, I, I did grow up in school. Baltimore. I did grow up in the UK. That's <laughs> oh, right. That also he, helps. he was British. <laughs> but I do remember having quite a big... Now, maybe it would have been the same if he'd been a woman, but I, I honestly feel like for me, it helped right. that uh, it was a man teaching me poetry. I think that's true. I mean, the professors and teachers that i keep in touch with were typically men yeah just because there was much more like interconnectivity and i loved my you know yeah. my woman teachers and the, yeah. yeah i had great female teachers too but that's, that's actually this great phrase from the women's movement which is you have to see it to be it yeah i think representation is important across yes. the board but yes. racially you know within gender exactly. class, everything so all i'm doing is i'm applying that insight that you have to see it to be it to areas where currently men and boys are men are hugely underrepresented. Interesting. So you you know you've just mentioned you so you see these things as as female, right? When was the last time you heard someone say female lawyer or female doctor? Was, I'm gonna suggest a while because yeah, it's, it's been a while. It's fifty fifty. And if I did hear it, I'd be like, oh, that sounds exactly sexist. But male nurse, yeah. Male kindergarten teacher. Man bun. That's what I wear. People <laughs> always call that male. I'm like, hey, it's just a bun. It's just, it's a, just bun. a bun. Let it's me have my just bun. Just exactly. <laughs> it's so stereotypical. I feel your pain. Thank you. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, <whatever. laughs> That's interesting. Now, I'm curious, like, this might be a little bit out of your study of expertise, but do we need gender parity in every occupation? I mean, it's a broad question, no. but... No. Yeah. And so it's important in some things, especially, you know, nurturing like academic yeah. careers. But here's what I think. So two things. One is I don't think we will get exact gender parity in every occupation. Right. And we should be OK with that to the extent that we're sure it's the result of genuine choices and genuine preferences and not artificial barriers. Mm -hmm. But so so, for example, I think the fact that we're now 50 50 representation in law and medicine is great because I don't think there's any particular reason why men or women should be, you know, less or more likely to want to be a lawyer mm -hmm. uh, or uh, a doctor. But deep sea fishermen, still predominantly male. Right. 
Uh, and I don't think that's going to get to 50 50. Right. Uh, and I think that's, and that is not because there are millions of women desperate to become deep sea fishermen who are being blocked by sexism from doing it. Right. It is to some extent the result of differences in preferences. Maybe firefighter would be another example. Now, what you want to do is make sure there's enough representation and that the barriers are not, that, that, that you can do it should you choose to. Right. Because there's always going to be some people that want to do it. And that's a difficult balance, of course. Like, how do you, what's the number? But I, I tend to think of, if I look at any profession and see that there's only, say, 5% of women or men in it, mm -hmm. I'm immediately thinking, there's something going on there. There's probably something going on there. When you get to 30%, you might start to think, okay, it's not necessarily going to keep going to 50. I see. Right? And the danger is that conservatives will sometimes say, well, of course, we don't have women politicians or women engineers. Their brains don't work like that. I'm stereotyping conservatives horribly. <laughs> but let's do it. Let's for fun. Let's sure. do it. Right. Yeah. That's they, the thing. We can stereotype here. It's fine. <laughs> okay, yeah. right. Their brains are different. Yeah. Right? Um, and you're like, okay. Even to the extent that there are genuine differences between male and female psychology, the distributions overlap so much. That couldn't possibly explain why only five percent of engineers are women. Yeah, that's it. Might explain right. why only thirty percent of engineers are women. That's about the cutoff for you for most occupations, roughly. And mm -hmm. actually, there is a very good study I have in the book. Um, it's quite far in the book, so you may not have gotten to it. I haven't got there. Um, in fact, this chapter <laughs> I think it's chapter thirteen, so you definitely didn't read this <laughs> bit. But th there's a lovely study by Rong Su and James Rounds where they look at what would what would occupations look like if men and women were choosing them based on their real preferences. Hmm. Now they've had to. They have these personality profiles, so they've used those to say, here's, here's what we think the world would look like under real choice. Mm -hmm. And they get to numbers like about 30% of engineers would be women, Okay, that number I just gave you, and about 30% of nurses would be men. Hmm. Not 50%, right? because there are still some differences on average, but a heck of a lot more than 5%. Or 15% is currently the number of women engineers, and, and 10, 11%, 12% is the number of nurses that are men. Mm -hmm. So I love that paper because... I thought that's exactly the kind of analysis you want, which is to say, what would it look like under conditions of real equality? And it right. wouldn't necessarily be 50-50. It doesn't have to be 50-50 to sure. prove equality, but it's sure as hell not five, except for some, maybe some very rare examples, maybe fighter pilots. Right. Maybe there's always going to be a gender disparity in fighter pilots or firefighters or something mm -hmm. because there just are differences between men and women in their interests and preferences. And also, I think consumer, okay. consumer preferences too. So my wife is a midwife. Mm. So she delivers babies. Yeah. And many women that are giving birth, especially if they're doing it in their home or in a birth center, typically, you know, a lot of them would like a female midwife. Yes. They feel like it's a much more uh, yeah. intimate experience. Yeah. That's and so cool. that's, a, that's a great example of an area where you probably wouldn't want gender parity. Right. Actually. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I guess the opportunity to be in the marketplace should be open to both men and women. That's right. Uh, midwife's a really good example. I love the fact, by the way, you had to explain to me what a midwife did. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're writing books all the time, okay? I've had three kids. You haven't had any kids, right? Your wife had okay. kids. Okay, <laughs> fair. But I was present at the birth of all three, and uh. I could tell you stories about that, but that's probably for another show. Fair. Um, that's a really great example, actually, of a place where you would want the option to select into someone of the same sex. And so am I okay with a world where there aren't very many male midwives? Yeah, I am. Yeah. But are there equivalents the other way around? Well, it's hard to think of any off the bat, but... I think one of the reasons I care so much about things like counseling and psychology and maybe special needs teachers, right? Most kids referred to special needs are boys, mm -hmm. but most teachers are women. Most special needs teachers are women. Hmm. And so you might want to say, actually, I'd quite like it if there were a lot more male special needs teachers. Maybe not all male, but given that most of their clients are male, mm -hmm. like midwives, right. by definition, their clients are female. Or maybe there could be some other areas too, mentoring programs, et cetera, where you'd actually be very comfortable with a very strong male skew. Right. Interesting. So I like this idea of your school. So Oh yeah. Yeah, we haven't finished the boys, yeah. boys start later yeah. in class. In they, terms of age. Everyone starts in the later in the day. More phys ed. More dudes teaching. We're working more, out all the time. More men teaching. This and, sounds like if right. you were running for like class president of an eighth grade class, like this is what your speech would be. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're putting soda in the water fountains. <laughs> no. Nope. All right. No more nope. homework. No, no, we didn't talk about nutrition. <laughs> okay. Definitely no soda in the water. We could actually replace the uh the crap that we currently call school lunches with real food. Right. That would yeah, be good yeah, for yeah. everybody. I'd love lunchables as a kid. Have you ever had a lunchable? 
Uh, I'm really happy to say I have not. I'm going to get you one. Uh, We're going to have a lunch. You can get it. Lunchables are awesome. Okay, this is a sidebar. No, no, no. They're killing everyone. Okay, you can have them when you're older. How about Lunchables are like cigarettes? You turn 21, you can buy Lunchables. Okay, that's fine. That's fair. You have to have like a license to do it or something. Are you you 21? You have to show ID. You have to be prescribed. You have to be prescribed. (laughs) Okay, that's fine. Yeah, well, pretty sure if you you eat enough of them, you will get diabetes. (laughs) So then you can get the insulin (laughs) to go with the lunch. So you have the Lunchable, but you have to be injecting insulin at the same time just put insulin in the pack the, the res- yes. yeah, yeah instead of a crunch bar have a little that's insulin a great in. idea that's great now one more thing you do in the school our imaginary school um is you would actually have more vocational tr- training it wouldn't be that you necessarily you know force everyone into just a vocational track right but on average uh boys seem to do a little bit better with a bit more hands-on learning with a bit more interactive learning and i've actually i've seen this with my own kids too and again it's important not to, to say that's true for all boys. So many boys, like I was more of a poetry guy. Like I loved John Donne. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good clip. <laughs> no, that's John cool. Donne. Yeah. yeah, I love metaphysical poetry. Yeah, yeah. I really do. Um, but I'd seen it in my own boys. It's like try and get them to sit and read a book. No chance. Ask yeah. them to take, a, take apart the refrigerator. Excellent. I was all over that. Erector right. set, Legos. Yeah. I loved it. As a I mean, my youngest son, it's like, well, like our refrigerator broke down the other day. And he's like, fine, I'll just take the circuit board. I'll get a new circuit board and put it on. It. And this is, I'm like, oh, okay. And I literally, my job is just to hold the stuff to him and like, <laughs> give it to him. And I'm like, are you sure? You're like, you've literally taken our You're refrigerator. Like John Stewart apart. Mill didn't talk about this. He didn't. <laughs> Mill had no idea how to fix the refrigerator. And I would just, but I want, and he pulled stuff out of the wall. And uh, so I do think that a bit of the stigma of shop class. The stigma that's attached to vocational learning really has to be reduced. And I think we do need more of that. More technical high schools, more learning that's not just instead of academics, but in but alongside of it. And a way of learning. I mean, you can learn a lot of physics and chemistry and math and so on with more hands-on mm-hmm. rather than just sitting there. Right. This experience of sitting still in a classroom is difficult. I I hugely struggled with it. Mm. I, I, it for me, especially when I was younger, it was literally torture interesting i was sitting on this I'm, i can to this day i can remember the feeling of the plastic chair that i had to sit in while the teacher was droning on and i would look out the window and tr- i i used to create these imaginary worlds to live in for a while just to survive wow the education it was horrible and i used to couldn't wait for break to kind of go out and run around and so on too and so uh of course that's not true for all boys and so on too but on average it is more true for boys that they're just going to struggle to sit still and pay attention for long periods of time. Can you talk to me about ADHD diagnosis? Well, that's one of the reasons why it's so much higher in boys, three or four times higher in boys. And Mm -hmm. autism, of course, massively more so. And I would definitely have had that diagnosis when I was a kid, if it had been around. Uh, And I've seen it, particularly one of my sons, just like like the real deal. Uh, Because I do think there's obviously a spectrum and sometimes it's over-diagnosed now. At the one, on the one hand, I'm thrilled that we're seeing it and we're treating it properly. But on the other hand, I'm a bit worried that at the edges, it starts to be just something like, oh, you're behaving like a boy. Mm. You've got ADHD. And so what we don't want is ADHD to just become another way to say boy. And mm. currently in the US, one in four boys have been diagnosed with some kind of developmental disability. Really? And that just seems high to one me. One in four? One in four. That's really high. And so I just, I, I'll be blunt. I don't think that's true. I think what's happening is that we're pathologizing some things that previously would not have been seen as a pathology, like mm. an inability to sit still, pay attention, right. hard to focus, et cetera. Is that a developmental disability or is the system just not accommodating enough diversity? Mm. And as the, as the system becomes more and more female dominated, there is a danger that even at the teacher level, that those kinds of differences are not celebrated. One of the, one of the biggest arguments for diversity of all kinds is that it allows you to recognize these differences and not pathologize them or think there's something wrong with you. So one reason why we need more women in senior leadership, for example, is so that the male types of behavior aren't the norm. Mm. You can have different kinds of behavior. But the same is true in our classrooms too. And I, I, and I think other, if we don't get that right, then we're actually we're in danger of labeling boys right, as in some way disabled when they're not. Oh, that's so interesting. And and I'm o- over-prescribe, basically. Right. Now, your, your idea is an actual policy thing that we could implement. Like, oh, let's start boys in school two years later. Yeah, that one, is, one year later. Or one year later. That yeah. is something that could happen next year. In My theory. question is, would all boys schools be a control variable for that? Like, have we seen all boys schools that boys are, you know, graduating and going to college at a higher rate or that they're excelling academically at a higher rate, considering that they're all starting within the same peer group? Yeah, well, 
to be clear, that's not my my proposal is not all boys school. Fair, fair, fair. No. That's a good question. Uh, my my proposal is that boys and girls go to the same schools, but that just as a default, we start the boys a year later, mm -hmm. so that the boys will be a year older on average than the girls in their class. And the reason for that is what we've already talked about, which is right. that they just develop later. But um, in an all boys so, school setting, have you seen any? data that oh boys are progressing at a higher rate or they're doing well in all boys schools ever. no there's not great evidence actually that single sex schooling makes much difference really yeah uh, it's the actual nature of the schooling itself yeah it's interesting and, and i do think it it poses some challenges honestly to some of my own ideas because those schools do tend to have more male teachers in them right um but good studies will like control for that kind of thing so they'll say is it the fact that it's all boys or is it other things mm -hmm. and and uh, the, to be really kind of boring about this the problem is that the kind of parents who choose to send their kids to single sex schools are not your average parents sure so if the kids are doing better it's really hard to tell if it might be a vocational or... religious thing it yes. might be higher income but, and also just the, by definition they're probably more invested in their kids success if you've gone out Perhaps. of your way and you said you're homeschooled for a bit right. same thing you can't really assess whether it's the homeschooling that's helping kids because my better. mom loved me more than other people yeah that's right <laughs> well i hope she's watching this <laughs> yeah and my mom sent me to school as soon as she could so she obviously loved me less than others. yeah but anyway that's um, british parenting you right? can't that's what it's exactly get off the school um <laughs> so we don't single sex schooling is hard what from, from what we can tell how being a year older does seem to help boys in particular and i think this is a really important point it helps boys from low-income backgrounds especially interesting because they're the ones who are at biggest developmental disadvantage mm -hmm. to start with so just giving them that extra year to mature it does seem to help them so kids from more less advantaged backgrounds are the ones that benefit ironically the parents who are currently doing this are actually the ones more from more affluent more educated backgrounds mm -hmm. they are holding their kids back i actually looked at um I got some data from a very well-known private school on the East Coast. I can't, you know, I can't name the school just for data reasons, but 30% um, of their graduating senior boys were old for their year. So they'd been held back. Ah, uh, interesting. Thirty percent, whereas only like five percent of the girls. This is like when they're right on the cusp of like the school yeah, age, and their parents. Can it was choose. more summer born. Yeah. So you can you can choose in private schools, and right. private schools are very proactive about this. In public schools, much less choice. In mm. fact, in a couple of places in New York City it's actually prohibited. Oh, really? You're not allowed to send your kid to school. If you're in the bracket, age. you're in the bracket. Yeah, in or out. This is, I guess, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, the Outliers, Outliers yeah. right? It kind of falls into the similar yeah. themes. Yeah, he, although the difference is that he really focused on being relatively old for your year. So it's like within the cohort, you're older. Right. Whereas actually the much better evidence is just being absolutely a year older. Just right. literally having another year of brain development yeah. uh, is, is what really counts. And it seems to help boys uh, especially. So I'd love to, I'd love some school districts to try this and then we can evaluate it and see, see what difference it makes. That's interesting. Okay, so we've established that this is a problem. We've established why it matters. And then we've established some solutions of what we can do to fix it. I kind of want to extrapolate to like larger society in general. Um, and I'm curious, you know, obviously family, employment, school, all these yeah. things are creating, I don't, I don't want to call it like a male angst, but I'm curious if you have seen any data that has contributed to or indicated that men are lonelier, more isolated mm -hmm. today than they were maybe 30 years ago. Yes. And why, you know, obviously the things we mentioned, but are there other variables that are contributing to yeah. that? Yeah. So the evidence on this is quite clear that uh, men are, more, are lonelier. Uh, there's some work from Daniel Cox, who's a scholar at AI, on the so-called friendship recession. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, the number of men who say they don't have a close friend has gone from almost none, like 3%, to about 15%. Mm. Yeah. And actually, men in their, uh, in their 20s are now more likely to say that if they have a problem, they'll talk to their parents about it than their friend. Interesting. Whereas you only have to go back about 20 years and it was the other way around. Mm. And so there has, there's been a, a general shift in friendship networks. And that's true to some extent for women too, but much, much true more for men, more isolated. When relationships break up, and particularly if it's a long-term relationship, a marriage, the men tend to do much worse socially. They struggle because I think the women have sometimes done the work to keep the social connections going. Uh, and so they are, men are m at much greater risk of loneliness after after a breakup. And so... I think one of the interesting things about this is that traditional families, marriages, kids, et cetera, they were definitely something that because of the economic dependency that women had, they held women down, but they also propped men up. Mm. They gave men a clear role. They gave them access to a social life. Very often their wives would be the ones organizing that social life and so on too. Hmm. But absent that, men are having to do much more of the emotional work of maintaining friendships and social networks than they used to in the past.
Which and we're not, and we're we're yeah. not used to it, frankly. I right. mean, just it's maybe a good uh, shift, but yeah, but it's harder. There's this SNL did this great skit called Man Park. I have you seen, seen that? It. No. It's great. You should link to it. Um, where it's just these women taking their partners to a park so that they can hang out with other men. Oh, hilarious! And there's they have IPA and they, and they, it's they, they stereotype the men horribly, but there's this real issue there, which is that women are saying very often that their their male partners are too emotionally dependent on them. Uh, they don't have enough friends. They don't have enough other support, and so they go to this thing. They go to man park, and and they and they they let their their men play together. It's obviously a skit on a dog park, and funny. one of the women turns to the other and says, "Which one's yours?" <laughs> I mean, it's so That's painful funny. because, it, but it's painful because it's it is sort of true. So you have all these stats about employment and family formation and earnings and college and all that. But I think you're right to point to a deeper question, which is sort of what I'm grappling with in the book is the question of what it means to be a mature man mm -hmm. today i mean you know, i think masculine mature masculinity is important and how we construct masculinity in a positive and pro-social way is a question that every culture has faced mm -hmm. every culture has had to answer that question in one way or another uh, and i'm afraid we're not really asking that question properly now and the result is this horrible vacuum where people won't even talk about it and on the one hand, you deny the existence of masculinity or you say it's toxic. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you say, we need to be, re, you know, you're Tucker Carlson. We need to be you know, really virile men again yes. who are like tanning their testicles. Put red light on your balls. Yeah. Put you never done this? I do this every morning. Uh, <laughs> even joking, even <laughs> if I was red lighting my testicles, as a Brookings scholar, I yeah. feel probably it's not a thing to share. Okay, fair. That's with fair. your audience. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but well, yeah, we got to go cut down trees and grow cut beards. Down trees and yeah. expose our testicles. Yes. Uh, Etc. And make it's, love to many hundreds of women, as That's, many as possible. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And obviously, like. And there's a really serious dimension to this, which is that, and I honestly see Donald Trump as an example of like an avatar of immature masculinity. Mm. But because he was sort of, he was just like a middle finger to the political correctness and everything else that's going on. The fact that even that the horrible video, the misogyny didn't really hurt him politically is because I think there's Helped a him. real market out there for right. people saying enough already. We need men to be able to be men, masculinity good. And actually in the middle, there's a whole bunch of most of us are trying to figure out how to be good men, mm. good fathers, good partners in a world of gender equality, which we all want. Yeah, right? well, we, we hope we all want. Most, most yeah, of us yeah, want. Yeah. And even, even like the most socially conservative people want it. Like Josh yeah. Hawley is a great example. He he's, has his own book coming out on masculinity. His wife is an incredibly successful lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I doubt that Josh Hawley wishes his wife were a stay-at-home housewife right i'm sure he's thrilled right. that he has a so no one really deep down wants to go back but in between the sort of boorish immature pussy grabbing version of masculinity that we get on the right mm -hmm. and the sort of hand wringing toxification uh reluctance to even engage with the issue on the left is a massive vacuum and that's where i think a lot of men are finding themselves now oh that's so interesting yeah i'm i'm curious are you familiar with the internet figure andrew tate I'm becoming familiar with the internet figure, Andrew Tate. He, yeah. uh, he's become yeah. very controversial. He's been deplatformed yes. for, yes. I guess, the things that he said about women and, and yeah. gender specifically. And yeah. I'm, I don't want to paraphrase to take it out of context. I'd encourage you to, to see yeah. it in, your, in, in yeah. some light. But I wonder if men like him and other people within, I guess you could say, the manosphere yes. um, have tapped into the feeling that men have. Absolutely. Where they're feeling lonely and disenfranchised and, and neutered. And they are sort of taking it in a misguided way. Completely. They're weaponizing it in one way or another. And I think that's happening in politics as well. But mm -hmm. I think that just culturally, I mean, he's like, you know, Jordan Peterson is like the thinking person's Andrew Tate, as far as I can tell. Because right? hmm. Jordan Peterson is actually engaging more seriously with these issues. Interesting. Or even though I disagree with him about a lot. And he doesn't really have a structural analysis of what's wrong with boys and men. Right. But I think that that's exactly what's happening, which is in the absence of a grown-up conversation about this really difficult moment we find ourselves in which recognizes all of the advances that we've made but also recognizes that that's brought some challenges with it for, mm -hmm. for boys and men absent that conversation you create a huge market and honestly i've seen my own sons go through it now i, I actually think that it's become a jordan peterson phase or a ben shapiro phase or god forbid an andrew tate phase is almost becoming a rite of passage for a lot of boys and young men. And then thank God they usually grow out of it. But it's almost because they're in a culture where we're not having this conversation in a serious way and mm -hmm. a responsible way. And it's an axiom of, of political and social life that if responsible people 
aren't talking about something and it's a real thing, mm. irresponsible people are going to come along and exploit it. That's exactly what's happening with this issue about men and masculinity. If we're not willing to engage with it responsibly and say there is something here, there are real problems facing boys and men, real. Mm -hmm. They're not made up. They're not misogyny in disguise. They're real problems. Mm -hmm. If we don't responsibly address them, acknowledge them, just make people feel heard is what a lot of people are doing, then honestly, we deserve Andrew Tate. Mm. if we're not willing to step up and do it because those audiences you know, will be and that those, feeling will be hijacked the demand is there by bad people. the demand is there so if he's the supply well that's on us so mm. his appeal his the success of these manosphere figures is our fault interesting and i'm curious what do you think the role of just briefly i know i, I can't have you all day unfortunately um a man in in, in high demand mm. um what is the role of technology namely dating apps and pornography yeah how is that impacting men's brains and interpersonal relationships yeah well uh, i mean dating dating apps is not something i've spent much time on but uh but it's quite clear to me that it's sort of recreating a very old world where some men clean up and do incredibly well hmm. uh, and uh other men really struggle so it's a bit like i know this one guy uh, who i've heard about who He's like dating dozens of women on this on this app, and meanwhile, fifty percent on the men are, are not getting matched at all. So he's like, he's the Genghis Khan of Tinder, basically. He's just like you've heard about me. <laughs> this is amazing. I didn't know you had heard about me before. But thank Sorry, you. That, that, that's your username. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> but as far as other fact, like, video games and porn like put them together. Okay. Uh, I don't find that much evidence that that. Uh, with the exception of a, a very few men who become addicted, sure, which is true of alcohol or yeah, anything. addiction yeah, to anything, addiction to anything is bad, crippling, and that's so. And porn can do that with a dopamine hit and so on too. But by and large, I don't see that much evidence that it's having hugely negative effects. Uh, same with video, video games, the same. My biggest concern is it might displace other activities. Is it's not so much what you're there's something wrong with what you're doing when you're doing that. It's more like what are you not doing, mm -hmm. right? And you, are you, are you not making friends? Are you not engaging? Are you not having in real life uh, relationships. But by and large, I actually think that the both the good news and the bad news is that the fact that we can have these online existences and in some ways get fulfillment from them, right? Success in video games. Um, ob obviously, the, the attractions of porn. Um, that in some ways that... It makes men a bit less agentic. They they re retreat a little bit, you know, because the truth is that, like, you know, actually dating in real life is hard. Mm -hmm. You get rejected a lot. It's yeah, difficult. Painful. You screw up. It's yeah. difficult. It can be painful. It can be painful. I mean, it should be painful, really. Right. Um, uh, whereas porn's not. And so porn is essentially, it is the very fact that porn is so painless. It's just there, mm -hmm. right? And you don't have to do anything for it or work for it uh, is part of the problem because... We don't have that many men who are acting out. Of course, you have a few famous examples of men who are acting out, sometimes tragically. But actually, there's a lot more men. I'm more worried about the ones who are just checking out. And I think that something that pornography is mostly dangerous because it's just easy. Mm. Uh, and the same with video games. It's like when I, I'm sort of almost old enough to pre internet, if I wanted to get any action, I would have to shower, dress properly go out right maybe buy a few drinks be interesting get multiply rejected yeah. try and have a conversation in sure. real life make mistakes get it kind of wrong so whereas if you can just go down to the basement mm. uh, it would be in a basement probably hmm? it would be in a basement well that's the stereotype of course yeah. but i have to tell you like all right, we had a basement and our kids did spend a lot of time in the basement <laughs> um but i'm glad to say that they would also then go out right uh and and take the the joy and the risk mm -hmm. of in real life right that's what we need to and, and so it's it's more just that it's um it's more what it, it displaces real life i'm I, i'm not uh, i'm not in a moral panic about video games and porn in the way that some people are at all i just i just right. don't see the evidence right uh, it's less of a issue than education and things like that in your opinion an issue. And, and it's just too easy it's, it becomes a stereotype you know it's like it's so easy to just say well if these men just didn't smoke so much weed and watch so much porn then they'd be fine it's like, uh, it's, again it's classic it's a classic example of blaming the individual what you're doing is you're saying it's their fault, right? It's, it's their because you know if they didn't if they if they weren't spending wasting all their time on video games and porn and marijuana, then mm -hmm. they'd be fine. And what it does is it individualizes the problem. What it says is there's something wrong with you. Mm. If you could just shape up and make your bed and get up and stop smoking weed and stuff, then you'd be okay. And what it misses is the fact that the economy, our family life, and the education system are all failing to give the kind of purpose and structure that a lot of boys and men need. And so you end up blaming the victim in right. this case. And I think that's unforgivable. Interesting.
Okay. And now j just as a last question, I'm curious about, um, and this might be outside of academia. I'm just curious, you know, advice that you would give your boys advice that you might give me as a 26 year old dude. Um, and a lot of people listening, you know, might be men of a similar age. Yeah. What advice do you have for me that I can start implementing on a daily or a weekly basis to just be a better man? Yeah. I suspect you're doing a lot of this already in the mere fact we're having this conversation, but I'm doing this for money. Certain, okay. okay. Well, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> no joke. Uh, you is to, to be under your own steam, just okay. be under your own propulsion, be show agency, mm -hmm. right? The, the, I would go as far as say the least attractive sentence that a man can ever utter is, I don't know. Not in the sense of like not knowing something intellectually, like if like this, but just like if your girlfriend or your boyfriend says to you, what do you want to do tonight? Don't say, I don't know. What do you want to eat tonight? Don't say, I don't know. Don't say you choose. Hmm. Uh, what are you going to do with your life? I don't know. What's your plan? I don't have a plan. Right. So agency, purpose. Even when my own kids, so one of my sons, for example, ended up being an e-sports professional coach. Really? Yeah, coaching video gaming. And I can tell you that was not on our plan for him. And he went out to Las Vegas. He got paid to do it. He's coaching this team. I uh, stopped out of college for a while to do it. He's back in there can now. You say what and, game? And he caught. Hmm? What game is he? Called? Rainbow Six Siege. <laughs> and, and 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 he called me and he's like, "Dad, what do you think? Do you think that I should, um, you know, should I take a break from college to go and you know be a video gaming coach?" And I was like, "Hell yes!" Yeah. Like, and what I loved about that was it was all him. Right. That was his plan. He had a dream to become an esports coach. And he, he pursued his own dream and he made it. He was under his own steam, pursuing his own path, his own agency. Mm. And ultimately just have purpose, have direction, have a plan, execute on the plan. Don't drift. Um, and don't allow the barriers that are in front of you to stop you from doing it. So be, like, I think there's something very, be your own woman, be your own man, mm. uh, pursue your own path. Uh, that matters more than anything else. Uh, what you're doing is less important than the way you're doing it. And then you'll be able to look men and women in the eye, including your partner if she happens if she's a woman, and treat her as absolutely as an equal because you you know she's going to be your equal. You need to make sure that you're her equal too. That's excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks I really for having me on. It's it. fun. Thank you. Um, if, right here, your camera. If you want to tell people about your book, where they can find it. All right. It, yeah. Great. Um, anything like that, please. The book your... is the book is called Of Boys and Men. Uh, I have a Substack of the same name. I'm on Twitter at Richard V Reeves. Uh, Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you guys so much. See you next time. Ooh, thank you so much. This was fun. Thank you.